This is Roger Green, host of the Surfing the National Tsunami podcast. This weekend, we are offering five conversations from episode 55, our wrap-up of the Liver Meeting 22, plus from the vault, a segment from our wrap-up panel at International Nash Day 2022 earlier this year. Before I start, I want to note how information-rich this episode was. As a result, my conversation comments will sometimes be more about identifying the topics we've discussed and a couple of key points about each than it is about providing the kind of detailed narrative I usually attempt. This final conversation from our wrap-up episode looks at the diversity of populations with NASH and other ways we can learn from and about them. Naeem al Corey begins by discussing work with pediatric NASH. Ken Kusi and I note the diverse forms of NASH, including both lean and pediatric, that are receiving increasing attention. I also mentioned the Splendor Study, which we talked about in Season 2, Episode 60 of this podcast, in which Naeem was a participant, and what it tells us about the ability of bariatric surgery-driven 20% weight loss to regress fibrosis in non cirrhotic patients. I touch briefly on Scott Friedman's observations in Episode 53, about the impact of environmental factors on the microbiome and how that might affect all these metabolic issues. And finally, we move on to a final question about the biggest change each of us expects to see in NASH and NAFLD in the year between now and when we come back for Liver Meeting 2023. With over 7,000 on-site attendees and tremendous amounts of positive energy, the Liver Meeting 22 produced exciting presentations, debates, and insights on a wide, wide range of topics. As we wrap up our fifth and final episode covering this event, you can hear us exploring some issues we covered earlier from a different perspective, and others we had never covered about this conference before this episode. So sit back, listen, enjoy, learn, and when you're done, join the discussion on our LinkedIn discussion groups. Name al One abstract I may want to mention is that, as you may know, that FIP4, other non-invasive tests we have, like the NAFL fibrosis score, they're completely useless in a pediatric population. We've shown that in several papers. People from Korea, from Italy, all show that FIP4 does not perform well in a pediatric population. A few years back, I developed a score called the Pediatric NAFL Fibrosis Score with a collaborator of mine, uh, Valerio Nobili. And that was uh, mainly in Italian children. We had a large cohort biopsy proven disease but when I tried to validate it in the US it did not do well. So at uh, the meeting Jeff Schwimmer group at UCSD presented data from the NASH Clinical Research Network where they had over 1100 kids with biopsy proven disease so you can determine the stage of fibrosis and they developed a new fibrosis score for pediatric patients to predict F2 or higher. I do believe that this has great promise obviously we need to externally validate it and also assess it changes over time and uh, this is something you can use for monitoring but I'm optimistic that uh, this could become a good screening tool and also a way to enrich pediatric clinical trials with patients with uh, more significant disease. I think it's an important topic because as we appreciate better the dimensions of this pandemic there's been far more focus on on lean NASH and on pediatric NASH. The the oversimplification historically had been that this was a disease of the overweight and the obese and the older and I think the more we look the more we learn that's just too simple. And by the way, not true, but not true because too simple. Ken Kusi. Well, Roger, I mean, uh, I interact a lot with pediatricians and they're very worried about this epidemic of obesity and diabetes, and they're finding a lot of NASH. And again, we bring to the case that there are things to do in these children today. I mean, sometimes I feel this inertia. Well, we don't have any approved drugs. Why would we screen? There are things we can do today. As you know, in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, tirsepatide had a significant impact in reducing obesity and normalizing liver enzymes in larger cohort of children between age 12 to 18. So there are things we can do now and it is very encouraging that we have pharmacotherapy to treat them. As you know, tercepatide is undergoing a NASH trial in adults, but I guess this could be rapidly applied to youngsters if the results turn out to be positive. I'm mindful of the idea that Naeem's friends at Cleveland Clinic did Splendor, which we had an episode on last December, but Naeem, unfortunately, was unable to join, but Ali Yeminium was there. And what they suggested is that if you can lose and maintain 20% weight loss through bariatric surgery, you can actually regress fibrosis a significant amount of the time. So as we start thinking about kids who have type 2 diabetes, which is really a horrible thing if you think about it, you know, and the levels of obesity, certainly anything that creates weight loss in those patients, as with adults, has to be a good thing. Jaren Schottenberg. I have a question here. So thinking back at the guideline presentation by Mary Ranella, she started out saying, 
taking that Pete's or taking out? Naeem, do you think that's a good thing at this point because we're going to get an in-depth Pete's guidance or is that a disadvantage for the Pete's because they don't have anything to hold on to yet? I'm not sure you, you noticed that, but in the presentation they said this is not covering pediatric NASH. Well, I have some good news for you, John. Number one, it's good that they're going to take it seriously and in-depth. But in the meantime, ACE in our guidelines, in the end, we did address what we know about PEDS. So there is somewhat of a guideline that can help primary care doctors and endocrinologists. But I agree, John, you're concerned that we should be taking this more to the forefront. And I'm fully supportive of that view. Just want to make a brief comment for parents who may be hearing and may be uh, worried about diabetes. It's not a horrible thing. It's it's something that we don't want, but it's never been a better time to have diabetes, if you can put it some way, than today, because we have really diagnostic and treatment approaches that can really prevent 100% the complications of diabetes. So the complication we see today of kidney disease, eye disease, those are for what we failed to do in the past. But today, if you are diagnosed with diabetes, you can have a completely normal life and have no complications and live a long and fulfilling life. So I just want to inject hope because we've made a lot of progress in the last 10 years. Before I go to you, Naeem, point well taken. I didn't mean to imply otherwise. What I meant simply to imply was that we talked in one of the previous episodes recently about all the different ways that diet and things that we put in the atmosphere have affected intestinal flora in significant ways and the interplay between that and changes in global diet and increases in obesity. It's not a good thing. I mean, it's great that we can treat the problems that result from it. But on that one issue, at least, it wouldn't be a bad thing if you could turn the clock back 50 years and just not do some of the stuff that we've done. And I, I think that was more what I was connecting to. Naeem, go ahead. In Splendor, we actually excluded the cervical patients. But this is the next project we're doing. So we will have that data for you on the regression of fibrosis and cervicals. So with that, we are to the bottom of the hour. And we've lost Will, who's had significant uh, bandwidth problems all the way through this, but we've got everybody else. So uh, this is the question I've been asking. I keep getting the same answer. I'm going to rule out the answer that goes, we will have drugs next year. Because that's the answer we get every time we ask this question. Once we go past the idea that we're hopeful that we will have drug approvals next year already or well on the way, what is the other biggest change you expect to see in how we think about or treat this disease? when we all reconvene next year for uh, Liver Meeting 23. Brave one, go first. Wayne Eskridge. Well, I don't know that it's brave, but let me get ahead of you. Then you guys can have some learned talk. One of the things that I see that it gratifies me immensely is that the umbrella, the definitions of things that are being studied in the milieu of NASH is widening out dramatically. I think the PEDS is a good discussion. The, the lean NASH that Roger just briefly mentioned is a huge problem. A year from now, we will see a broader field of study about liver disease and the comorbidities that go around it. My quick comment here is I think that, you know, all the good work um, my colleagues have been doing in non-invasive uh, biomarkers, including Laurent, who's joined us today, Kenneth, obviously, uh, with all his guidelines works. I think we'll see FIP4 emerge as a standard test to be ordered in diabetic clinics to identify patients that are referred for additional testing. And I think this type of practice patterns will emerge uh, even stronger. And I'm very hopeful for that. That would be fantastic. Ken is smiling and clapping quietly as, as you say that. Jorn, very happy. Well, Jorn always has brilliant ideas. What else can come from his mouth? But what I would like to see is that, again, that all the guidelines have kind of accepted the FIP4 with the you know, limitations, but initial screening value. I would be happier, and I think this is going to happen, if we get primary care doctors, endocrinologists, and hepatologists to treat diabetes and obesity now. But, you know, not just with a pat in the back and, you know, go see the endocrinologist, but everybody get on the same page and really be very, very proactive in prescribing lifestyle changes, pediatric surgery, and medications to really um, uh, prevent cirrhosis. Laurent Castera. Yes, if I may echo what Jorn and Ken just said, I'm very happy to see that uh, we started with the ESL guideline last year, and now we have four different guidelines that are aligned on the use of the pathway FIP4 then uh, elastography. And I think this is very good news for the field because if we want to go outside of the liver field and the diabetes field, this is a very important message to convey to the community, to convince, to raise the awareness of our colleague and to 
increase the screening rate of uh, nephrology patients in this setting? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I'm very encouraged with the baseline risk stratification uh, developments using NITs, but, you know, what's going to emerge next year is how we identify at risk NASH, the patients that need to be treated with pharmacologic treatments. And I think by compiling the data to um, hopefully regenerate and maestro NASH, that we will have enough to really develop a pathway on how to monitor response to treatment with NITs without needing repeat biopsies. I was very happy to see that in the guidance also, they're talking about these NITs to identify at risk NASH. So now we have four of them. We have the FAST, we have MIFIB, we have the MAST, and then we have corrected T1. And I think this is going to be housed in specialty care, but I think we still need a little bit more data before we're confident how to utilize these. And I think that data will be generated uh, next year. Laurent had a fantastic paper that took a look at some of that, which has been discussed several times on this podcast, but not today. So I'm going to go back to the thing I've been saying, which is it's not only exciting that we'll have all these guidelines, but as commercial entities start to believe that we will have drugs and we will have a brighter future, money flows in. So not only will we have guidelines that have some common points, but I believe that there will be resources to educate a far broader audience far more aggressively than we've had in years past. You could feel some of that starting in 2019 and then Ella failed and OCA did not get approved and everybody receded from that. But now we've got guidelines in place. We've got I think, some decent consensus around what the important things to do are. There are still debates about the value of FIB4. Of the last, last week on this podcast, there was a discussion from some people who I thought had been very strong on FIB4 saying, gee, maybe we should look to go to FAST a lot earlier than we do right now in a lot of these patient populations. But they're assuming FIB4 is already in place and widely used, which it isn't. I believe that the presence of the guidelines plus the commercial motivation to educate faster will lead us to make large amounts of progress very fast, very quickly. And now back to Roger. We hope you've enjoyed this recording. If you have any questions or comments about the content of this conversation or the entire episode, please send an email to questions at surfingnash.com. We'll be back next week with Shira Zelbersagi, probably the world's leading researcher on nutrition and NASH, along with Ken Cousy, probably the world's leading endocrinologist on NASH. Shira will be giving us tips about diet and self-management that will behoove all of us to keep in mind, particularly the Americans heading into our annual Thanksgiving food orgy. It's a great episode. You won't want to miss it. Until then, stay safe, surf on, and we'll see you on the podcast. Bye-bye. Bye now.